Awesome. Mm. Random girl in the green, give me a thumbs up. <laughs> she looked so worried right then. <laughs> So, of course, we have ourselves our wonderful guests here today. And, of course, we have a man who has done, you know, just a couple of little things that I guess you might have heard of at some point. Who here knows Attack on Titan? <laughs> See, I know you know this one. I'm just going to do this. Who here knows Yuri on Ice? <sighs> Weeaboos. Weeaboos everywhere. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the YCC 2018 stage. I'm going to say this wrong and I'm so sorry. It's all good. <laughs> Josh Grilly! Yeah. Oh my god. Do I? Love you. <laughs> I love right. it. Shall we take a seat? Shall we stand? This dude, I love it. He's got to walk. He's got a megaphone. Yeah, he's got the megaphone, but it's on like the lowest level possible. He just comes up and he like whispers with the megaphone. I love you, Josh. Like, I love it. I love <laughs> For when you. you want to be loud, but you also want to be silent. When you want to be loud, but intimate. <laughs> megaphone. <laughs> How's it going, guys? Thank you so much for having me to the UK. This is my first time ever across the pond. Really? Yeah, first time ever. In the How UK. are you finding the UK so far? It's awesome. Apart from being lost in Manchester. <laughs> Apart from being stranded at the airport, it's been great. <laughs> like, yeah. It's I, been like, I don't know how many so <laughs> How do I get to Sheffield from Manchester? How do I do this? How do I UK? It's fine, yeah. it's fine. You got there eventually. I, I've got to admit, I, I stayed up a little bit late because it's like, you turn up eventually, I must have missed you. I need to like, I need to borrow the, the main thing and just and wear it and then just have it say like, is this Yorkshire? <laughs> is this Sheffield? <laughs> is this Sheffield? With just a picture of Manchester. Oh, you didn't have to actually give it to me, dude, that's fine. No, it's, no. it's fine. It's fine. It's a present, it's yours now. Oh, I'm going to keep it. <laughs> I'll take it back to the States with me. Oh, so yes, so. Moving swiftly on, I suppose I should probably ask you some kind of questions. Sure. You know, find out some kind of things about you. Please. Um, right, so let's start from the start. How on earth did you get started off in your wonderful voice acting career? I was lucky enough when I, when I was a kid that my mother saw how full of creative energy that I was and the fact that I constantly tried to reenact or do impression of, do impressions of or anything, anything I saw on TV. I think, and especially cartoons, like I grew up with animation, it was my first real love. I'm pretty sure my first words in this world were DuckTales woohoo. Uh, and so, and, and my mother put me into theater when I was five years old as a result. And so like I just, I, I did theater from the time I was, pretty much from the time that I could talk and read and uh, have been doing it ever since then, but in, around the time I was like nine or ten, and uh, Pokemon, well, you know, kind of became mainstream in the states, and then uh, got cable and got Toonami, and, you, know, you know, I got to discover like Dragon Ball and Sailor Moon and all those things. My my love for anime, you know, like solidified then, and so I kind of decided at that moment, huh? I love acting, I love anime and cartoons. I'm just going to be a voice actor. I want to. I want to chase after it. And so, uh, before I even graduated high school, I got my first professional gig, and I've been doing it ever since. Going on for 14 and a half years now. 14 and a half years. Yeah. Wow. I mean, obviously, you've been in anime. You've been in anime. Mm -hmm. I'm at over 300 characters now. 300. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I don't know half of them. I'm gonna be. Me neither. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like, I mean, you may have noticed during the cosplay con, whenever the anime characters, I'm like, yeah, it's that anime thing! Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like, it's Shiki from Yenge Meshi, your... <laughs> Yen Yen Meshi! <laughs> um, but yeah, so, what is your favourite anime? Do you have an absolute, hands down, this is the yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, I have my absolute favourite anime, and it's one that I'm, I'm not in. I, like, they haven't made any of it since well before I, was, I started my career, was The Slayers? Do you know the Slayers? I, I can't say. Anyone, anyone heard of the Slayers? Alright, cool. Uh, one, two, three. Three people have heard of the Slayers. That's more than at most cons. That's more than almost any US con, I'll tell you that right now. It's heartbreaking. Uh, no, Slayers, okay, who here that have never heard of Slayers? Who's seen Fairy Tale? 
I see a Lucy Arcphelia right there. I know she's seen fairy tale. Uh, so yeah, Slayers was kind of the 90s fairy tale. If you like swords, sorcery, and comedy, but also with a good story and a lot of action and heart, check out the Slayers. It, it's, it was my first absolute anime obsession. I bought everything that I could, and then Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball came along, and then I bought everything I could of those things. But yeah, for the most part, Slayers has always been, and probably always will be, my all-time favorite. Hmm, very nice. Yeah. A, a, a very left field choice there. Nah. It, it, yes. It, it's the I who wants to play with this one, but of course I know it. I know, yeah, so, no, um, yeah, so I'm just cool. showing off how old school I am. <laughs> I used to collect Slayers on Laserdisc. No, Dizzy, there was VHS. Oh. There was VHS. There was Laserdisc. And Laserdisc releases. Who here used to collect it? Who here has been in, like collecting either anime or comics and stuff for so long that you actually had Laserdiscs when you were young? All right, like three people total. Yeah. So like those of you who you know who did not have it, Laserdiscs. Essentially, I'm gonna sound like such an old man. Uh, laser discs were kind of, you know, there was the format long before DVD. It was even like VHS wasn't even as big before, you know, uh, until afterwards. But laser disc, you would get two episodes, tops, only in subtitles, with no, no extras, nothing. It came on this giant disc about that big. And uh, you had to wait another year for the next two episodes. <laughs> so. We get it much quicker now. Yeah, and much smaller. And, and now we're just like, hey, you know, 1,600 animes a year. Yeah, pretty much, dude. Like, it's just Funimation alone produces 20, upwards of 22 anime a season. 22 dubs every three months. That's crazy. Yeah, every three to four months. Okay, when you're watching Subdodult, I've, uh, I started off dubbed. I started off as a dub fan. I'm still a dub fan. Uh, I do watch subtitles. I enjoy subtitles. Uh, so there are some shows where I'm just like, I can, I can only really enjoy the sub. Other shows is like, I can only enjoy the dub. Like Dragon Ball. I can only watch Dragon Ball dubbed. But like... Yeah, I, like yeah. Goku's voice is Goku's voice. Yeah. Because that's all we've ever... Yeah. 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 It's too high-pitched in the subs. Yeah, I can't. I can't deal with it. But yeah, that's... Mm. I watch both. So tell me, of all of the 200 characters, mm -hmm. obvious question, which is the favorite? I can't pick one. Yep. I'm not picking one favorite. Okay, I love all of my children. Like big memorable moments that you've had while you've been recording. Right, let me know. I'll make this easy. I have five. I have five favorites. Oh, not well. Tell us all. Yeah, I have five favorites. I alternate them as my thing, as my career has gone on. Uh, new people have come in or knocked other people off the top five and I pick them based on a was I emotionally invested in them when I was doing it or did the, did the character mean something important to me while I was playing them second was it significant to my career and uh, C do I still love it even after years you know after having done other stuff so top five first Kenichi the mightiest disciple it's Funimation, it was my first, it was my first, it was kind of the fanboy dream come true situation because, I, again, I'd grown up listening to Dragon Ball and Sailor Moon and all this other stuff growing up. So for my very first role ever as a, as a voice actor for Funimation, I was the lead role, the namesake of the show. It was a 55 episode some odd series. And all of my martial arts masters were Dragon Ball actors I'd grown up listening to. Chris Sabat, Sonny Stray, Vic Mignogna. All these guys are just like these. So it was literally like every day I'm in the booth, I'm just like, <laughs> that's Vegeta. Piccolo's teaching me to do karate and he's drunk. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of really fun stuff. Uh, second, Kurnosuke from uh, Princess Jellyfish. Do you, are you familiar with Princess Jellyfish? I, I can't say I am. Uh, I, I, I had a you? big concerted effort a few years ago of, yes. I will watch anime, I will get into it. And I did. I, I kind of, I kind of, you know, the the shell of anime, the big popular ones I managed to watch, yeah, yeah. and then every time I tried to deal, drill down deeper into that shell, I realized that there were endless layers of anime. You will never get out. And yeah, you will never stop watching it, and yes. you'll still have a thousand more to watch. But that's okay. It's a great journey. It's a journey worth going on. 
it's a fine place to be stuck. Uh, Kurenosuke, anybody here familiar with Princess Jellyfish? Again, like the same two or three people. Alright, Princess Jellyfish was a really amazing show for me, personally. Like, it came around at a time when I was getting really burned out on anime as a fan, because we had this massive influx of, like, nothing but fan service shows for, like, two years straight. Where it's just, it's like, okay, yeah, sure, massive, bouncing cleavage that sparkles like candy and defies all logic and, you know, laws of physics. It's fun for a while, it's funny, it's great to accentuate a joke or something along those lines, but... It's alright, we're coming back around for that. But it's not... You can't, you know, use it as a crutch for storytelling. So, like, I was just getting really burnt out on the fact that we had nothing but this coming out of Japan, and then along comes Princess Jellyfish, which, if you, you watch the, just the opening sequence, is all you need to watch is the opening credits, and you can tell that that show was made by nerds. Hardcore nerds. Okay. It's like the very first. Uh, in that opening, we have re visual references to Star Wars, Singing in the Rain, Mary Poppins, uh, The Wedding Crashers, uh, Bruce Lee, like uh, I think it was uh, Into the Dragon or something, and like just all sorts of crazy stuff. There's just like, oh, these people are me, these are my people, they're making a show. And so it was really cool to be a part of. The second thing that was really cool is uh, the character I got to play, Kurenosuke. When we're first introduced to him, we think he's a woman because he's a he's a crossdresser, and that's his thing. And one of the greatest things about that was, I mean, I got to I got to be fabulous every day. I got to pretty much do my my uh, rarity from My Little Pony impersonation. Yes, darling, you look wonderful. It's fabulous. And so, and, and that was his voice whenever he was in drag mode. And the entirety of the show is him in drag convincing these uh, other these women, only one of whom knows he's a crossdresser. They all the others think he's a girl. Uh, they're all otaku in their own right. But whereas Kurenosuke sees his geekdom and his otakuism and his through crossdressing as being something that he's proud of and something that defines who he is, and he just lets his uh, freak flag fly wherever he goes. These girls see their fandoms as something that makes them outcasts and makes them uh, unworthy of being in society, and so they hide away. They they all like they, they live in this little house that they never leave, and they call themselves the sisterhood, and they want nothing to do with the outside world because they think that they are weird and ugly, and and so. But then Kurnowski comes along and is just like, oh no, honey, you are like he he shows them and teaches them through the show that no your your interest in the things you love are what make you beautiful. Let them fly and show it and everything. It was just it was a wonderful experience. Uh, after that, Armin in Attack on Titan. Uh, it oh, was, um, Lauren Landis doesn't play by the way. Oh, hi, Lauren. She was here last year. Yeah, I mean, before. she was telling me about it. Her and Tatum were both telling me about yeah. it. Yeah, coming out here. The, all a good thing. I, I should hope so. We basically sat in the bar all night. Yeah. Saturday night. <laughs> so, um, Armin was really cool for me because it was kind of like my fandom going full circle, where my fandom started on Toonami. Then I, I had a role and stuff on Toonami on American television, and it was this huge thing. And it was also really cool because uh, I was I was a fan of the show before we ever even knew that we were going to get the rights to it. So I got to watch the entirety of it, and I was just a fan of it, and I loved it, and I loved Armin, and then I found out we're getting the rights, we're dubbing it, and she's like, oh, I want to audition, I want to audition, I want to get, I, and like, and my, my biggest wish was just, I want to play Armin, and then I got it, like, that never happens, does it happen, and so like, yeah, it, that, it, it was really crazy cool, uh, fourth, Yuri, Yuri on Ice, kind of another show that, like, like Princess Jellyfish, really broke the mold. Like, it, no, it, like it, it's... And, and it came out of nowhere, too, because it was just... It, there was no original material that it was based on, there was no manga or anything like that. It just kind of... It was just an original animation. Like, like Jellyfish, it was a, a risk for that Japanese company to take because it wasn't a guaranteed sell. And, oh my gosh, did it pay off. Like, within the first two or three weeks of the show being out, it became this worldwide phenomenon. And... It also dealt with uh, and, and portrayed a lot of different lifestyles and stuff, and I thought that it was the first time that I've ever seen in an anime, especially, or really any medium, uh, just a very healthy, very uh, natural...
natural look at a gay relationship. Because they didn't tote it in front of everybody, like it wasn't queer bait or anything. It wasn't like, oh, they might be gay. It was, oh, they're gay. Cool. Back to skating. Like, it's, yeah, it was, it was just so wonderfully handled. And because of that, because it wasn't gimmicky and it wasn't made to be this whole, like, oh, look, they might be a thing thing, like, people really gravitated to it and, and it in a lot it touched a lot of people's hearts and it made a lot of people like I've, I've had people tell me that that show either inspired them to pursue their art again or inspired them to get physically better so that they could go back and do the sport that they loved when they were in high school or they came out to their parents or they finally decided to live as themselves and be happy and comfortable it's like just the fact that that show can reach and inspire so many different people from so many different walks, walks of life, I think really shows how special it is and how well written it is. I, I also think that every local skating rink loved the fact that oh, it came I'm, out. Oh, I'm sure. And then, and then the Olympics, too. They won the, the Winter Olympics that just happened. The Japanese pair skaters the, that came out and, and, and competed, they skated to the Yuri theme. And we had Olympic commentators. We had Olympic...